everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Brian Rogers, and I'd like to kick things off with a question I'm sure many investors have asked themselves. What makes one portfolio better than the other? Well, spoiler alert, there's no definite answer that solves this mystery for us. But some investment researchers believe there are factors that can help explain what drives returns, and that gaining exposure to these factors may help an investor outperform. Two of these researchers are Eugene Fama and Kenneth French. In 2015, they developed a model that identifies five risk factors that their research suggests can account for about 95% of the difference in returns between diversified portfolios. Now, some investors have made these five factors key pieces of their own portfolios, including today's guest speaker. Here with us is Ben Felix, portfolio manager and head of research at PWL Capital. He also runs his own YouTube channel and co-hosts the Rational Reminder podcast. Ben's going to help us understand the performance of the five risk factors in the FAMA French model and share his considerations for gaining exposure to them. Ben, it's great to have you here today. It's great to be here. Hey, I was just saying I, when I actually read that factor, the five factors um, of the FAMA French model, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. Do you ever run into that? <laughs> I, maybe maybe I don't say it in uh, in full often enough to find it to be a tongue twister, but it is a mouthful. I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, one of the things before we jump into uh, all the details about factor investing, one of the things I'm curious about is you invest your own money. You've uh, mentioned this to me using the five factor investor investing criteria, and you even wrote a research paper on it in, back in 2020. What sparked your interest in this approach? When you get into the world of investing, there, there's a lot of opinion, uh, a lot of different ideas about the optimal way to invest. I come from an engineering background, so I, I like to think about things in a way that's systematic and, and evidence-based. And when you go down that path in the world of investing, it kind of all leads to, or, or all paths uh, in, in the evidence-based world lead to this approach to to investing. So you, you mentioned the, the five-factor model that Fama and French came out with in 2015, that followed uh, an earlier three-factor model that they had uh, that came out in the 90s. And that really revolutionized the, the field of academic finance um, and, and, and portfolio theory. So again, what, when you kind of start asking yourself, how can you think about managing your portfolio in a way that's as close to scientific as possible, because we're still talking about a social science here with, with economics, uh, th this is where you end up. And so that's, that's where, our, where I ended up. <laughs> We're excited to learn all about factor investing, but before we get into the details, just a quick note for our audience. Some of what we, we will touch on is Ben's personal approach to factor investing and some of the considerations for his own portfolio. So it's not intended to be financial advice that broadly applies to everyone. So make sure to do your own research and assess your unique goals. As, as Ben's even said, there are so many factors out there and look at your own needs before making any investment decisions. So with that said, let's get into it. All right, the first question, or first off, what I want to know, Ben, is can you explain what factor investing is for us in a little bit more detail? And why do you personally choose to invest your own money using this approach? When you buy a stock, you're buying expected future cash flows. Asset pricing theory is asking how much how, how investors decide what they're willing to pay for expected future cash flows. So in the 1960s, we got the capital asset pricing model, which relates uh, risk and, and relates uh, asset prices to uh, risk with respect to the risk of the overall market. So in, in the case of the CAPM, investors care about how risky a stock is relative to the risk of the market. A riskier stock has a higher expected return. Anyway, um, so that's a single factor model. The innovation of Fama and French, when they came out with their 1990 paper, uh, a couple of papers, uh, they, they really just said, hey, there are some anomalies that the capital asset pricing model can't explain. Maybe this isn't alpha. Maybe the market isn't efficient. Maybe they're just additional risks that investors care about when they choose how much to pay for, uh, for future cash flows of stocks. So basically, they'll pay a little bit less for smaller companies. They'll pay a little bit less for lower price companies because those companies are riskier. So that is the basis of factor investing, that there are more than one risk. There, there, is, there, there are multiple risks that investors care about when they choose how much to pay for a stock. The nice thing about that theory for portfolio management, for investors thinking about how to invest their own money, is that 
we can associate those risks with characteristics like company size and like relative price. And we as investors can choose if, we're, if, if it makes sense for us to take those risks on intentionally. I, I've spent a lot of time researching this and reading about it, not only about factor investing, but about um, investing in the stock market. I do have a higher risk tolerance and therefore I can tilt toward these risk factors in my, in my personal portfolio comfortably. So, and I like to think about it from a risk factor perspective. I think that just makes good logical sense. There's also some comfort in believing that the market is efficient. <laughs> um, but to be fair, and Fama and French acknowledges, acknowledge this in all of their papers too, we really don't know whether these anomalies exist because of mispricing or because of risk. Value stocks outperforming the market or outperforming growth stocks in the long run. That's an empirical fact. We can observe that by looking at past data in the US and Canada in any international market over most time periods. The empirical fact everyone agrees on because it's an empirical fact. The theory, so I just explained multi-factor asset pricing theory. So the theory is is debated, hotly debated in academic research. You can caution that factor investing may not be for everyone. So which sort of investor might this approach be a good fit for as you see it? Yeah, it's, it's another really, really good question. As soon as you start getting into tilting toward risk factors, you're deciding that you're different from average. So that's on, on, on the theoretical side, that's a, that's a tough one because it's very hard to know whether you're different from average in a way that makes it make sense for you to take on more, uh, more risk. And then one of the other big practical considerations is that it's, it's, it's just a lot more involved. Now, pe people listening to this, to this conversation, they, they might hear that and think, well, that's fine. I'm used to trading stocks. I'm used to trading ETFs. I'm used to converting currencies and all that kind of stuff. And that's fine. But the reality is when you move from a single security portfolio assuming that's the alternative, like a single total market portfolio to a multi ETF portfolio with ETFs that are listed in uh, multiple countries. Like we'll, we'll talk later about some of the ways to get exposure to these factors. You start having to look at ETFs that are listed in the, in the U S we did a paper uh, in 2022 where we tried to figure out a way to conservatively estimate the expected return advantage of a, a moderately factor tilted portfolio over just a market cap weighted portfolio. And we did that by looking at the historical data and basically giving it a big haircut. And we found uh, as an estimate about a, a 35 basis point expected return advantage for the factor tilted portfolio uh, over the market. So the question any investor has to ask is given that expected return advantage, are you in a position to take those risks? And does the added complexity make sense? Do you have the time to dedicate to managing a, a more complex portfolio? Yeah, there's a lot of scary words in there too, right? You're, you're hearing risk and one that scares me sometimes, science. <laughs> I have a son that's in a science program. He boggles my mind what he does. But uh, yeah, a lot of those things in terms of that effort and that amount of time you want to put in there. So, you know, we, we go into some classes with clients that are pretty simple in nature where we're talking about passive versus active investing and things like that. So you're saying this would definitely be more of an approach on the active side, but even like uh, improving a little bit your active investing. Is that, would that be fair to say? That's a, that's a really interesting question because the, the definition of active and passive, I think, is, is pretty blurry. I consider factor investing the way that we're talking about it to be kind of an, an extension of, of passive because it's built on the same principles. It's built on the principle that markets are efficient and that as an investor, all you want to do is capture risk premiums. So in that sense, it's the same thing as, as, uh, as, as the theoretical passive portfolio where you're just trying to capture uh, risk premiums. All factor investing is doing is saying, if you as an investor are different from the average investor, you can tilt more toward uh, risks that most investors want to avoid. Oh, that's a great clarification. I think uh, you know, our audience really would appreciate that to know, okay, well, I don't have to sit here you know, nonstop and look at my computer and have you know, five screens going. This could be something that's more of a step up even in that passive approach. So, so thanks for clarifying that. Well, those that are saying, well, show me the numbers, show me the numbers on this. How would you say how closely the five-factor model has been able to account for asset price movements, historically speaking? 
Yeah, well, when, when you look at the data, the, the cap M was able to explain maybe the, the capital asset pricing model could explain maybe two thirds of the differences in returns between diversified portfolios. Um, with a five factor model, it's, it's about 95%. So wow. what that means is if you take two diversified portfolios uh, and ask why their performance was different, about 95% of the difference is going to be explained by exposure to the five factors in this, in this model. So it's pretty extreme. And again, from the investor's perspective, that matters because if you look at a fund and say, oh, well, hey, this, this active manager has produced pretty good returns, maybe better than the market, the first question that you want to ask is, did they do that because they were skilled or did they do that because they had exposure to these risks? And that's relevant, again, because you can get exposure to those risks through low-cost ETFs as opposed to paying for the expensive talent that is required to run an actively managed fund. So what would be any missing elements that the five-factor model cannot explain? So the five-factor model specifically, uh, momentum is the big one that it struggles with. And momentum, it, it doesn't really have a place in risk-based asset pricing theory. Momentum is like uh, the, the returns of stocks that have done well recently tend to be higher than the returns of stocks that have not done well recently, basically. Um, and, that, and that's a factor in it that's quite strong in, in the data, that, that effect. And it's not well explained by the five-factor model. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's not well explained by factor models in general, because Fama and French have a six-factor model that they tested in one of their papers. But it, it, it's, it's a real factor. It, it, it has historically had a premium. The big question is whether investors can exploit it. And I think that's an open question. Uh, there are funds that, that target momentum. The, 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 the question that's open for investors is whether funds after costs, because momentum is a very high turnover strategy, uh, whether funds can actually, actually capture that momentum premium. And it sounds like you're, you're ultimately in the end, the answer is that you are a, a big proponent of the, the five-factor investing. I want to bring some things together in the fact that we've gone over some theory, and I really appreciate you taking us through that. But let's uh, give our audience just a breakdown of the FAMA French five-factor model. What are the five factors and um, uh, what sort of premiums have these five factors delivered in the past? All, all of the premiums that, that we speak about are, they're, they're, they're called long short premiums. Lots of words there. Uh, long means that you own an asset. Short means you've sold the asset. Maybe people listening are familiar with that part. A long short portfolio, when we're talking about the, the data uh, that, that we're speaking about today, is, is the uh, w one side of the portfolio so the long side, minus the other side, the short side. So the actual factors. Market beta is the, is the first one, and that's the market in the, the table M MKT. So it's actually the, market the total market return minus the treasury bill return. So the result is the equity risk premium, the premium that you earned for investing in stocks instead of investing in the risk-free asset. Hmm. Now, all of the other numbers are constructed similarly. SMB is small minus big. HML is high minus low, high, high book to market minus low book to market, which is really value minus growth. RMW is robust minus weak. So that's firms with robust profitability minus firms with weak profitability. And then CMA is conservative minus aggressive. So that's conservative growth in the book value of assets minus aggressive growth. Uh, when we look at the market risk premium across US developed markets and emerging markets, uh, you can see there in the U.S., 5.7%, um, a little bit lower in developed markets over this time period, uh, and then emerging markets uh, at 5% over this time period. And I'll just stick with the U.S. for a second. When you look across the, uh, the, the, the columns here, the size premium in the U.S., going back to 1963, has been a little over 2%. Uh, the value premium has been 3.26%. Profitability, 3.07%. And investment, 3.41% percent over over that time period and then you can see in the other regions that the premiums have all been uh, positive i don't have t statistics on here most of these are statistically significant the size premium is a standalone so if you're just looking at should i own small cap stocks at at their otherwise market cap weights uh 
What the data show is, is that those premiums have not been statistically significant, still positive, but not statistically different from zero. But where it gets interesting and why size always still appears in these models is that all of the other factors tend to be much stronger within small caps. And it, it's important to keep in mind that this is all empirical. So these are things that have been observed in the data by researchers. Hey, this type of stock has historically had higher returns than this type of stock. Uh, th this has also been tested in, in all different geographic regions. Um, so while it is empirical, there are light theoretical underpinnings and the empirical side is very strong. It's not like we just observed this in the US market. It exists all around the world uh, and it's been persistent through, uh, through time periods. And I know one of the examples you've come in, in with us already is the fact that you could look at the size of a company. So I know you've said, you know, a fund may look at relatively low price, small cap stocks as an example, or companies with high profitability and, and low levels of investment. That would be something you might be utilizing versus, you know, just the traditional large cap stock that, you know, might everybody might be going towards. Is that an example of a, a factor you might look at? Now, I want to reiterate something. These are all long, short premiums. So if you build a portfolio that's like a, a market cap weighted index, and then you add onto it a, uh, a, a small cap value ETF, for example, you're not going to capture all of those long, short premiums. You're going to capture a portion of them. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, I, I think that's really a, an important point to take away. And that's where earlier I mentioned the 0.35% the as the expected premium. So you could, if you look at the, the factor, the long short premiums here, that's obviously more than 0.35%. Our 0.35% was the estimate based on a moderately tilted factor portfolio. So just capturing a portion of those expected premiums. So in that hypothetical factor tilted ETF, what you would probably see is a de-emphasis so reduction relative to market cap weights of the short side of the factors. So that's the, the large stocks, the growth stocks, the low profitability stocks, and the high investment stocks. Um, so the factor tilted portfolio is going to reduce the weight of all of those types of securities relative to the market. And it's going to increase the weight of the long side of the factors. The biggest weight increase in a factor tilted portfolio relative to the market is going to be in those uh, low priced small cap stocks with high profitability and conservative investment. So those based on this theory have the highest expected returns in the market and therefore a factor tilted portfolio would deviate from the market most aggressively on those stocks. All right. Well, you, as you had mentioned, there can be significantly different or a significant difference in the premiums for the five factors over various time frames. And some investors may have shorter investment horizons, horizons. So how have the five factors generally performed on a rolling basis? The rolling returns have been very attractive. So if we take any given 10 year, uh, any given 10 year period, most of the factors, size being the exception, standalone size, so just the, just the premium small stocks over big stocks, um, most of the other factors have been more reliable at delivering a positive premium over 10 year periods than the market risk premium. So, I mean, that, that's interesting. And then the other thing that's interesting is that these premiums show up at different times. So it's not just that they've been more reliable over 10 year periods, but it's also that if you take a given period where the market uh, did not deliver a positive premium over a given time period, historically, there's a pretty good chance that one of the other factors did deliver a positive uh, premium. So, I mean, pretty interesting. Again, that's historical data. Uh, we're, we're talking about historical correlations now, which are even scarier to, to use as uh, predictors than historical returns. Um, but still, it, it, in the historical data, all of this is very interesting uh, in, in terms of the reliability of the premiums over time. All right. Well, putting it all together, what sort of returns has the five-factor approach you employ managed to achieve over the broader market? It, it, it's kind of interesting because in, in more recent history, uh, the, the factor approach has not done great. And, and that's largely because the factor approach uh, is, is closely associated with, but not the same as value investing. And value stocks have been kind of clobbered over the last 10 or so years. 
Uh, so if we look in the relatively recent history, n not, not so great. Um, but if we take a bit of a step back, uh, I've got some data here from, from 1975 uh, until partway through 2020. And in that case, the premium for this is this is an index, not a live fund. Uh, the Dimensional U.S. Core Equity Index, which is like a, a moderately tilted um, factor uh, portfolio for, for U.S. securities. And comparing that to the CRISP 110 Index, which is a, a, a market capitalization weighted, like a total market uh, U.S. equity index. The premium over this time period for the factor tilted portfolio, uh, factor tilted index, was about 1.4 percent. Now, it's important though that that premium. So when the premium is positive or when the premium is negative, in both cases, a more aggressively tilted portfolio would have a bigger difference in performance. If you have a really aggressive factor tilt and you're underperforming the market, and you care about that, and a lot of investors do because it's hard to ignore, like especially people that are managing their own portfolios um, through the direct investing type, type channel, you, you can't help but see what the index is doing. Uh, it's right in front of everybody's face all the time. And if you're underperforming that, uh, that can be painful. In my experience, people have a much easier time uh, not getting excited about the gains when they happen. Uh, than they do ignoring the losses uh, or, the, or the the negative tracking error uh, when that happens. It's uh, p people don't get too excited when the positive premiums show up, but they get uh, re relatively more more upset when the negative premiums show up. True, true. The losses hurt more for sure. Well, one of the challenges we have in in these segments and anything we do from a investing education perspective, Ben, is going from that theory into application. So how would a, a Canadian investor interested in factor investing consider building a portfolio with exposure to these five factors in the in the FAMA French model? Yeah, so this is something that I've I've been trying to figure out for for a while. Um I, I spent a ton of time digging through ETFs and, and trying to figure out how you could piece together a portfolio that would be somewhat representative of what we do for PWL Capital clients. Um, but just in an ETF wrapper that, that you can get through through the discount broker's channel. And the way that I allocated it was a third in Canada with a market cap weighted fund. Uh, then I've got a third in U.S. market cap weight. And then I did 10% in U.S. small cap value. Now, this is important. My preference is to tilt toward factors across the market cap spectrum. So that means you've got uh, within large caps, you're tilting away from the biggest stocks, but you still own them. And you're tilting toward the lowest priced large stocks, but you still own the higher priced ones, just in lower weights. I got all of the factor exposure through small cap stocks. So I mentioned earlier that those premiums have been historically a lot stronger in small caps than they have in, in for example, large caps. So because I had to use US listed funds to get these exposures, I wanted to minimize the, the amount because there are all sorts of other implications that come with buying US listed uh, securities. Like you've got the currency conversion, you've got withholding tax, you've got other potential tax issues. So I tried to minimize that by getting all the factor exposure through small cap value. Uh, and then I've got uh, an emerging markets market cap fund in there, uh, international developed market cap at 16% at of the portfolio, and then 6% relatively small allocation in inter international developed small cap value. Again, the, the, the withholding tax issues with that US listed ETF of international stocks, they can be not ideal. So I, I wanted to minimize the uh, minimize the exposure there, but still still get some exposure. So there there are internationally diversified multi-factor premiums in this portfolio. Uh, but again, it's all coming from small cap value stocks to try and minimize the amount of US listed ETFs that you have to buy. Are there any other considerations that you would have like when building a portfolio that aims to you know, emphasize the five-factor premium? The, the, the things that I'm not crazy about are the withholding tax implications. Um, when you have a U.S. listed ETF that owns international developed stocks or, or emerging market stocks, in a registered account, well, in an RSP, it's actually not so bad because in the RSP, you're exempt from withholding tax from the U.S. ETF to the Canadian RSP account. Um, you still eat the, the withholding tax from the foreign countries to the U.S. ET, ET, uh, ETF. But you've just got one layer of withholding tax that you're giving up in the RSP account. In a TFSA with a U.S. ETF of international developed stocks, you're eating two layers of withholding tax because you're 
uh, you're still paying withholding tax from the U.S. to the TFSA account. So that's from the U.S. ETF to the to the Canadian TFSA account. And you're also eating the withholding tax from the foreign companies to the U.S. ETF. So there's two layers that you're giving up there. In the taxable account, it's somewhat similar, where if you hold a Canadian ETF that holds foreign stocks directly, you're giving up. Uh, well, you're not giving up any withholding tax because it's recoverable when you file your tax uh, when you file your tax return. Um, whereas if you own a U.S. ETF of foreign stocks, you can only recover one layer of the withholding tax. Anyway. All right. Great. Well, all right, Ben, we're going to have to wrap our conversation there. Thanks for breaking down the data behind factor investing and some of your considerations when taking this approach. So it's fascinating stuff. Now, I wanted to take a moment to dive into WebBroker to show our audience how they can screen for funds that may help them gain exposure to uh, some of the risk factors we've discussed. So I know you actually displayed on the screen some examples there, uh, but we can actually screen ourselves using one of the tools in WebBroker uh, to take a look at some uh, ETFs or funds that might be be utilized in this strategy. So if we go into the research tab, you're going to click on research and then you're going to go to screeners to get the, to the same page. And I'm going to utilize the ETF screener. So we're going to look at exchange traded funds that might have some of the factors we're looking for. I did have, did have one that I already created that I'm going to show you, but I wanted to show you to start this from scratch. If you click on create custom screen, you're going to have a number of criteria you can choose. You have a portfolio, rating and risk, etc. But normally what you're going to want to start with is a fund category. So let's say we wanted to look um, by size, one of the factors we've talked about as maybe a small cap value. If we click on here, we can choose our country down at the bottom. So we added that through the criteria added button up at the top here. So we're going to look at fund category. And then as I scroll down, I'm going to go to uh, the letter S because I'm looking for a small cap, for example. And so as I continue scrolling down, you can see I'm in the letter M, continue going, and I think I just passed it. So I'm going to continue. We've got to just go a little bit slower. Here we are. We're getting to small blend, small growth, small cap. So now if I add on here, if I wanted to see United States small cap uh, ETFs that might be available, there's 31 matches. So now that's getting that down to more of a bite-sized uh, view that we can look at. We can view the 31 matches. And then we can add other criteria as well, because this is pretty plain. It's just showing you the actual uh, ETFs that are available. You can do a comparison. If you select up to five of these, you can do a quick comparison, or you can go back to edit the screen and you can add in other criteria around performance, profitability, and things like that. So another thing you can do if I go back to the very beginning of research and screeners, because I saved a screen. This is another thing you can save these screens once they're done. I can click on screeners and then I can go to ETFs again. And I have one saved for looking for, say, broad-based index funds in the U.S. as, as a quick example. If we go to Underneath here, we can see I looked for Morningstar rating. I was looking for tracking error. So that's how well the actual ETF tracks the index itself, how accurately it does that. There's a couple other criteria. So when I click on view matches, this is what I did add in. You can see this up at the top. You can see lowest management expense ratio. I'm looking for lower or below average yearly turnover, things of this nature. So you're going to see these come up in each one of these columns. I've got turnover, which is just how often that uh, portfolio is turning over, how often the manager is um, selling, having to sell some of the investments and turning it over. You want that to be fairly low. And then you have 10 year, five year return is what I added in in terms of the actual return for these funds. And then we have tracking error. We have a Morningstar rating, but you can add any other criteria that you wanted to find under the edit screen, but it's a really good way to give you more of a bite-sized view of some investments that you might consider that are going to possibly follow an index or, or track a broad-based or, or even a narrow-based index if you want to look at it that way. But it is a great tool to help identify and, and narrow down some investments that you may consider adding to your portfolio. Okay, so hopefully that demo helps our viewers get started in their research. And if they're looking for other resources to consider in the research, where are some places online they can go to find out more? Ben, do you have any uh, any suggestions there? Uh, well, I guess shame, shameless plug for the the stuff that we've done on this. Um, but we've got uh, we've got two papers. Uh, one. One that we did on how to implement a three-factor portfolio, and and at that time we we did that because there there just weren't ETF products available to implement a five-factor portfolio. Um, so we we did that paper, but then ETFs started coming out that that directly and intentionally target the the factors in the five-factor model. So I, I we did another version of the paper that went deeper into the five-factor research uh, and showed how to do that with uh, with some of those five-factor ETFs. So those two white papers. 
And then we've got the paper that we did last year on expected returns for factored tilted portfolios. So those are all pretty good resources. And I mean, you can go directly to the research. I like guess it's all, it's all published academic research that it's based on. Um, but I'll, I will say that it, it took me uh, many more hours to dig through that research and make it somewhat digestible than it will take you to read the paper that I wrote based on, <laughs> based on my doing that. So if you want to go to the source, the source is there, but the source is, uh, is pretty dry. I think people would like the short form for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for chatting with us, Ben. It's been a, a pleasure. And for those in our audience, make sure you register for any upcoming live webinars and check out our library of on-demand content. This will actually be on-demand as well. It's going to be available in the Learning Center and on our YouTube page. So see you all next time.